Welcome back to another book highlight. We're picking up where we left off with David. Uh, we're now in chapter 23 of My Rival the King, coming down to the end. And we pick up where David finds out that his men want to stone him. So recapping, you know, what has brought them to this point. They are all weeping. All the mighty men are weeping over their wives and children who've been captured by the Amalekites. They came back to Ziklag after the Philistines uh, released them and found that the city that the Philistines gave them had been burned and their people had been taken by the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites were a despicable people that, that God had told Saul to eradicate and he hadn't done it years ago. And the men couldn't handle the thought of what would happen to their families in the control of this enemy. The Bible says grown men, David's mighty men, stretched out on the ground and just wept until they had no strength left to weep. That's what scripture says. It's an intense scene. And David, right along with them, this is deep mourning and grief and wild lament. And the ancients were very good at that. They went deep all the way into mourning. They took it very seriously because they were mourning, you know, the, the loss of their families, but they were also grieving the fact that they were not there to protect them. They were grieving what was going to happen to them. And mourning, the thing about it that we don't often understand in our culture that doesn't embrace it in the same way as the ancients did, is that mourning is necessary and it's important. But depending on what you do with it, it can lead you closer to God or farther away from him. Grieving isn't wrong, but what you do with it can be, just like how we're supposed to be angry and not sin. So the men's grief, the mighty men's grief, was not heading in the right direction. And how do you know if your grief is heading in the right direction? Well, theirs was turning into bitter unbelief. If your grief is in the midst of the Lord's presence, if you're grieving in the Lord's arms, just casting yourself on him for mercy and grieving, you're still open to hope. You're still open to hearing God's voice. And this is what we learn from this terrible moment in David's life. We can look at what he did with his grief as opposed to what his soldiers did. David had been anointed to lead Israel and he'd been learning leadership among the mighty men all this time that God had brought among him. And now they all wanted to kill him. It made sense for David's men to grieve. I mean, what good man in his right mind would not grieve over his wife and kids being taken by what was basically ISIS in that day that they were living but their grief was turning to anger and their reasoning for stoning David or wanting to stone him was that David had led them into battle with the Philistines as undercover mercenaries and they left their families vulnerable in Ziklag and so this was a tragic oversight and we talked about how that might not have been sanctioned by God completely and they wanted to kill David for it they were blaming him Scripture says that each man was bitter in soul over his wives and children, and that's why they wanted to kill David. The scripture links their desire to murder with being bitter in soul, even though they had good reason. Again, God doesn't fault people for feeling torn apart or even feeling recrimination, but the Bible states very clearly in many places that bitterness never leads to anything good. It's a, it's a poison that corrodes our souls and it cuts us off from any kind of redemption God might have in the situation, which later we find out God did have redemption in the situation, but bitterness cuts us off from that. And that's what David's men were doing with their grief. But David's grief was different. His led him to the Lord. The Bible says, but in his distress, David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. And that's what we can learn from this chapter and the, and this portion of scripture. David's grief led him closer to God, and that was a choice he continually made in the midst of his grief, and that's why he was called a man after God's own heart. You know, that was one of many reasons, but one of the main reasons was because he always cast himself on God, and he didn't let his emotions or his circumstances poison his trust in the Lord. When we're grieving, we often get offended in our grief, and we're, we get very defensive and protective of our grief, acting like we have a right to allow offense into our hearts because of the magnitude of what happened. But while God is right there to comfort us, he also wants us to see the way forward. He wants to give us hope and solutions. And those wonderful things can't be found outside of God. But that's where bitterness wants to lead us, outside of God. We do have control over the direction our grief leads us. We don't have to like the situation or fully understand it, but we can cast ourselves into God's merciful character that has not changed. And we can 
strengthen ourselves in what we already know of God, even when we're not experiencing those attributes now. I think it was Spurgeon that said, this is trusting God where we cannot trace him. This is what David did, and it changed everything, leading to the rescue of their families. Now, you may not see an option for immediate rescue in the natural in your circumstance, but your trust in God is just as powerful and carries just as much redemption and hope as David's did. Trust in the Lord forever, David said, because the Lord our God is an everlasting rock. And I hope you are encouraged by this section of scripture to cast yourself back on that everlasting rock over and over again and build your house there. That way, when the storms come, you will be able to stand firm.